I fear, frankly, that there's been a lot of lip service by both sides trying to say that they're committed to peace, when in fact, I think everything outside of these negotiating rooms suggests that they're just preparing for more war. Welcome to Global Dispatches, a podcast for the foreign policy and global development communities and anyone who wants a deeper understanding of what is driving events in the world today. I'm your host, Mark Leon Goldberg. I am a veteran international affairs journalist and the editor of UN Dispatch. Enjoy the show. In mid-August, the United States and Switzerland hosted peace talks for Sudan's warring parties. The talks took place outside Geneva and came at a time when the conflict was exacting a massive toll on the civilian population of Sudan. Just as the talks were getting underway, the UN confirmed a famine in a massive IDP camp in Darfur. Meanwhile, over 10 million people have been displaced by the fighting making it the largest humanitarian crisis in the world by the numbers. The civil war erupted in April 2023, following a failed democratic transition. Two generals, Burhan, who leads the Sudanese armed forces, and Hamedti, who leads the paramilitary rapid support forces, began fighting for control of the country. For over 500 days now, the fighting has not abated and has been fueled by outside actors like the United Arab Emirates and Egypt that are supporting factions fighting in this war. At this point, nearly every part of Sudan, which is a massive country, is impacted by this conflict. There have been some attempts at international mediation, none of which has stuck. Over the summer, the newly appointed U.S. Special Envoy on Sudan, Tom Periello, began laying the groundwork for these talks in Switzerland. The talks in Switzerland recently concluded, and there is obviously still no ceasefire in Sudan, but according to my guest today, Cameron Hudson, these talks nonetheless did achieve important progress on getting humanitarian aid to beleaguered populations. Cameron Hudson is a senior fellow in the Africa program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies and someone whose work on Sudan-related issues I've turned to since I was an early career journalist covering the international response to the genocide in Darfur 20 years ago. I'm glad to have him back on the show and to continue our ongoing and regular coverage of this crisis in Sudan. You know, despite the size and scope of the Sudan conflict, it simply does not get the attention it deserves from most other media outlets. But because here at Global Dispatches, we are not commercially driven, we are able to cover the kind of global stories that other outlets tend to overlook. And we're able to do so because of your support. So thank you. You can continue to support our work by going to globaldispatches.org and buying a subscription. Each subscription we sell goes a very long way to letting us do our work week in, week out. And for your subscription, you'll get lots of bonus content and my own essays on international issues. But most importantly, you'll know you are supporting our unique style of humanitarian journalism. So thank you. Again, please visit globaldispatches.org. And there's a link in the show notes of this episode. Now, here is my conversation with Cameron Hudson of the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Cameron, I was at the Aspen Security Forum in the middle of July, and on stage, Antony Blinken hinted that the State Department was working on something big regarding Sudan. My ears perked up when he mentioned it. Now, a couple weeks later, the U.S. announced that there would be peace talks in Switzerland. So we're talking not long after those talks concluded. And I'm very glad to have you on the show again to discuss Sudan and what happened at those talks and where we go from here. To kick off, though, can I just have you explain how was it that the United States was the one to convene these talks in Switzerland? 
Well, I think in fairness to Washington, they've been involved in Sudan from the outset of this conflict. I think for many of us, we would like to have seen them more in a lead role, in a lead capacity. But certainly since the naming of a U.S. special envoy to Sudan back in February of this year, we have started to see the envoy and the administration behind him playing more and more public role in trying to both, I think, highlight the issues that are at risk and at play in Sudan, whether it's political, security, or humanitarian, but then also, I think, really feeling their way about what the next iteration of talks might look like. You have to remember that in the very early days of this conflict, our ambassador to Sudan, who was displaced at the time from the country, convened with the Saudis some preliminary talks in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, which resulted in several rounds of essentially face-to-face talks between the two parties to the conflict in Sudan, the army, the Sudan Armed Forces, and the Rapid Support Forces militia. And so they announced at that time a kind of framework agreement about essentially how the war would be conducted in many ways, not Mm -hmm. targeting civilians. They actually announced some preliminary ceasefires. None of that ever held, and there were certainly no consequences on either of those parties for violating the terms of that framework agreement. But it was something that I think Washington wanted to build on. There was a precedent, an early precedent, that we could get these two sides talking. I think the challenge was that when the envoy came in, I think there was probably not a big appetite on the part of the Saudi government to host talks again, or at least maybe a a more fair way to say that is that I think the envoy had more enthusiasm for trying to convene the parties than the Saudis did. And the envoy you're referring to is Tom Periello, a former member of Congress and a former State Department official dealing with Africa issues. Correct. And so I think that in the first few months of his tenure, there was a tension that existed between higher ups, I think, in U.S. foreign policy who saw real value in a partnership with the Saudis on Sudan, especially as we have a very complicated bilateral relationship with Saudi Arabia. You know, for people like Secretary Blinken, this was an opportunity to kind of deepen ties around a shared interest. But at the same time, the Saudis were clearly not matching our level of interest in trying to bring an end to this conflict. And in many ways, the Saudis, as it has been written about now publicly, might have been, in fact, dragging their feet on renewing those talks, because in the meantime, pressure was mounting on their kind of regional rival in the United Arab Emirates for the UAE's support to the Rapid Support Forces militia. And so Mm -hmm. there was this kind of perverse incentive that the Saudis had in the spring of this year, where as their regional rival was kind of twisting in the wind, facing a lot of diplomatic pressure to cease their support to the RSF, the Saudis were perfectly happy to let that happen and to delay a return to talks. Mm. But the fact of the matter is, on the ground in Sudan, the situation was worsening by the day. We are now at a point where parts of the country are under a famine declaration, and only more parts of the country are going to fall under that same declaration as the weeks and months go on. And I think Washington and the envoy were feeling that pressure to do something. And so this idea of talks in Geneva was a way to get out from underneath the sort of Saudi stranglehold on these talks. They have, I think, in a diplomatic compromise, been made co-hosts of these talks along with the Swiss government since it was being held in Switzerland. But really, this formulation was an effort to really give Washington greater control and latitude in trying to bring the parties together and doing it with a great deal of alacrity, given the consequences on the ground for not trying to get to a ceasefire. Yeah. You know, one of the knocks that I have heard articulated on international diplomacy towards Sudan is that there's just been like a proliferation of peace processes. You had the Jeddah process that you described, you had other regional processes. And now this one is, seems to be layered in as well. But the way you describe it, it, it does seem to supplant that Saudi process. So is this like Geneva process to your mind? the main peace process at this point, the singular one? That's yet to be determined, I think. So just last week in late August, 
the first round, as they're calling it, of talks in Geneva or around Geneva concluded. But if you noticed from the statement that the U.S. made, along with the other international actors who were participating in the talks, they made no reference to a follow-on round, either when that would convene, where that would convene, and who, if anyone, would be a part of those talks, specifically Mm. regarding the participation of the army who boycotted sending a delegation to this round in Switzerland. So I think it's hard to say right now that this is the only talks I'm actually hearing about other talks, which might be getting organized, whether it's in Cairo or Nairobi under the Kenyans. There seems to be a continual churn of, mm. I don't know if it's goodwill or you know self-interest that is driving this yeah. stampede of processes. But one correction I would make, though, is this idea of a peace process, because these talks in Geneva and previous rounds of talks have been interchangeably called peace talks. They've been called ceasefire talks. They were called humanitarian talks. And I think this gets to the nub of the problem. It's not just a proliferation of actors and venues trying to advance something. It's what is it that we're trying to advance, right? And I think when you look at the announcement that was made by the United States that they were going to hold these talks in Geneva, it was very clearly about achieving a ceasefire between the parties because the ceasefire was the thing that was going to enable humanitarian access. When it became clear early on, that the army was not going to send a delegation, we pivoted and said, okay, now we're talking about humanitarian access. We're not talking about a ceasefire. Mm. We're not going to get a ceasefire. We need to be talking about humanitarian access so that we can save lives. But in the background, and maybe even parallel to all of this, is this idea of all of these threads, whether it's humanitarian access or ceasefire, it's all linked to a larger political settlement, this idea of a peace process. And so All of these threads are running in parallel to each other, but there is no centralized convener of all three of these. And I think this idea of how we sequence these talks, I mean, originally we thought the sequence was ceasefire, humanitarian, and political talks. Now we are at least at a point where it's humanitarian, possibly ceasefire, possibly political talks. But even Mm. that is, I think, kind of open to interpretation right now. Okay, so take us to Switzerland, to these talks. Who attended and how did these talks unfold? Certainly on the who attended side, as I said before, the United States led the talks. They were co-hosted with the Saudi government and the Swiss government in and around Geneva. They were also attended by delegates from the UN, the Secretary General's Special Representative for Sudan, the African Union sent their representative to the talks. And then the two other countries that were there in an observer capacity were the Egyptians and the United Arab Emirates. That was the core grouping. And there were elements of all of those delegations that represented both the kind of political side and the humanitarian side of those governments. So I think there were multiple tracks of conversation that were happening in Geneva. But significantly, you mentioned earlier one of the key players initially you know, boycotted the talks. The Sudanese armed forces opted not to send a delegation. That's right. And I should have mentioned earlier that the other side of the equation, the Rapid Support Forces Militia, they did send a delegation. And they were actually quite quick to respond when the original invitation was extended. Within a matter of hours, they have said that they would send a delegation. And to that point, they have repeated that wherever there's a second round, they will send a delegation. And they're using this as, I think, a way to try to demonstrate a point, which is that they are more committed to peace, that they are more committed to governance in the country, that they have a vision for the future, and that they're willing to talk to anyone anywhere to end this war. And so that's becoming, I think, a compelling argument, given the fact that the Sudan Armed Forces has been, I think, portrayed, especially by some of the comments that the U.S. envoy has made as being very recalcitrant in the idea of talking. And as a matter of fact, in the days after the Geneva talks ended, the head of the army, General Burhan, gave a speech where he said it very explicitly that we're ready to fight 100 years to win this war and that they had absolutely no intention of negotiating with the rapid support forces. 
It's just worth emphasizing what you just said, because I found this to be extraordinary, that just at the conclusion of talks that the Sudanese armed forces did not attend, the head of the Sudanese armed forces, General Burhan, gave a speech, gave a press conference in which he pledged 100 years of fighting of war. Does not sound like a successful outcome to a peace conference. Well, certainly in that respect, I think we are no closer to having any kind of face-to-face or even what they're now calling proximity talks with the army. I'm not the envoy, but I think if he was here, he would say that the opening of the border crossing in Adre, Chad, into Darfur, the number of trucks that have rolled across that border that have received both customs clearance to enter the country and guarantees from the rapid support forces that they would be able to travel the several hundred miles to one IDP camp in Darfur in particular, Zamzam camp, which has the highest incidence of famine in the country, that because those trucks with food are arriving in those camps, frankly, as we speak, that that is the biggest outcome of this conference Mm -hmm. that we should not ignore. And that's true. There are going to be people who don't die this week because they are being fed by an agreement or as a result of agreement that came out of these talks. And so as modest as that be, it is quite significant and we shouldn't ignore it. Yeah, I I do want to emphasize that because, you know, that is the key outcome of these talks is, again, on the humanitarian front. You mentioned earlier that talks that ostensibly were supposed to be at a ceasefire political agreement. Really, the biggest outcome was on the humanitarian front, because just set the context a little bit for months now, the government of Sudan has prevented aid from flowing over some key border crossings from Chad to Darfur. But even so, whilst in Darfur, it's the RSF, the paramilitary group that controls most of the routes to those IDB camps. And so there has been this inability to get aid across the border. And as you noted, that one key outcome, one important outcome from these peace talks was an agreement to get those trucks waiting on the Chad side of the border over into Darfur to Zamzam camp, which just uh, a couple of weeks ago was declared a site of the worst famine in the world today. So this is significant. On the political side of things, did the government of Sudan, the Sudanese armed forces, give a reason for not attending these talks? Well, they gave a number of reasons, first of which was the fact that the UAE was included as an observer to the talks. So they argue, quite rightly, in fact, that the UAE is supporting the RSF militarily, and therefore they are enabling the war to continue. And so how can a country that is contributing to the war effort be a part of a peace effort, that they don't deserve a seat at the table and that the army is not going to sit around a table with people who are helping to carry out the war. Now, that's got a certain amount of popular appeal among certain segments of the Sudanese population who are quite upset at this support that the UAE has been giving the RSF and blame them for much of the destruction of the country. I think at the same time, the argument that the US and others would make is that any agreement that emerges from these talks has to be supported and implemented by all of the parties to this war. And whether we like it or not, the UAE is a party to the war. And Mm -hmm. so, you know, you can either have them on the inside under this tent and therefore kind of on the hook to implement whatever agreement comes out of this, or if they're excluded, then you leave them as potential spoilers on the outside of this agreement. And so that was the logic, I think, that the United States employed in inviting the UAE to be a part of this so that they were not spoilers for whatever came out. Obviously, the army didn't see it that way, didn't share that opinion. And again, I think that's one of the the challenges of the diplomatic situation that, you know, Washington really pushed to start these talks, did not have all of their kind of ducks in a row diplomatically in terms of getting the army to agree to this, or at least to understand Washington's point of view. And so you had talks that were not as successful as they could have been uh, because the army wasn't there. And now, frankly, you have a kind of finger pointing exercise where the U.S. is pointing their finger at the army saying that they're not ready for peace and the army saying, 
that Washington didn't listen to them and to their concerns and didn't take them into account when organizing this conference. So I think we're not in a particularly good diplomatic situation between the U.S. and the Army right now. And unless that gets resolved, unless we can kind of bridge this divide, I fear that a next round of talks is probably going to result in a similar outcome. Well, what key outside players could exert leverage over Burhan and his Sudanese armed forces at the moment to get them potentially more in line towards a peace deal? Well, I think the problem is, is that the kind of traditional powers, which is to say the Saudis and the Egyptians, they were at the talks. And, you know, I think from everything that I've heard from the U.S. delegation, they seem to suggest that the Saudis and the Egyptians are on board with a ceasefire process and humanitarian access, that they see that this war has gone on too long, that they share the United States' view that the parties need to negotiate a settlement. And so the U.S. has kind of portrayed these powers as being very much on the side of wanting peace. I think the problem is, even if that is true, which I have some skepticism about how true it is, but assuming it is true, what we have seen in the last several months is that the army has really begun to diversify its network of support. And so you have countries like Iran, who have now been contributing weapons to the army. You have the Russians, who have reportedly signed an agreement with the army that would allow Russia to utilize the base of Port Sudan for naval purposes uh, of the Russian Navy, and who are also in, in exchange contributing weapons to the Sudanese. And now you have General Burhan making an announcement that he's going to China next week for a China-Africa conference, and that he hopes to engage both the Chinese and other, you know, sort of sympathetic African leaders. So he is engaging countries with whom Washington has already very strained relations, and which Washington has very little control over to help secure his military position. And so As it turns out, I think the Saudi and Egyptian role, as strong as that has been historically, is perhaps a bit diluted as you have these new actors emerge to support the army. I mean, the picture you're painting right now is exceedingly bleak. I mean, you have the RSF, which, you know, let's remember, has committed mass atrocities, potentially to include genocide against civilian populations in Darfur in recent months. They seem to be the ones that are at least showing up for the talks, whereas the Sudanese Armed Forces has been, as you said, recalcitrant. Meanwhile, there are fewer and fewer levers of international pressure that could be applied to bring them more meaningfully to the table. Where do we go from here to your mind? Well, that's a great question. And I think Everybody right now coming out of these talks last week is, I think, trying to figure out what those next steps will look like. I think the next big diplomatic moment is at the UN General Assembly, which is about a month away, a little less. General Burhan has said that he would go, that he would be Sudan's representative to that summit. And so I think there's an expectation that uh, the United States will try to organize some kind of hopefully ministerial level meeting in New York to try to build on the momentum that might have come out of Geneva to try to shine a light on the situation there. That's the next, I think, hoped for opportunity. But again, I think what you're seeing from the army is an effort to kind of dig into their position and to build up some resilience to whatever international pressure that the United States might be able to put on them. So it's not clear exactly right now, you know, what the next steps will look like. Obviously, I think the focus right now is on humanitarian. I think there's an opportunity, though, to build confidence and build trust and build momentum if you can reach agreements on humanitarian access, because it requires both sides. It requires the army to give its consent for border crossings to happen and requires the RSF to give their consent to move through RSF areas and through all the checkpoints. So it requires agreement from both sides. One of the challenges around everything in Sudan has been this trust deficit that exists between the army and the RSF. And so if you can try to rectify some of that by building trust around humanitarian access, perhaps that's a place to start. But I think the parties are very far away right now. As much as the RSF might claim to be interested in peace, it is more interested, I think, in preserving its existence and ensuring that it does not face a day at The Hague somewhere down the future 
for their role either in the genocide in Darfur 15 years ago or for the atrocities and genocide that they may be committing Mm -hmm. today in Sudan. So I think neither side is particularly focused on a peace process. I fear, frankly, that there's been a lot of lip service by both sides trying to say that they're committed to peace when, in fact, I think everything outside of these negotiating rooms suggests that they're just preparing for more war. So lastly, as you just noted, the signs are not good on on peace talks, and the prospect of a ceasefire is seemingly very, very far away. But you know, there was progress on the humanitarian front with the opening of the Audre border crossing. What are you hearing from humanitarians in terms of like the next big potential win, potential ask on the humanitarian front? Is there like a progress that could be made on the humanitarian front that would signal that what we saw in Geneva, the opening of this border crossing, is something that could be built upon? Yeah, I think that the next phase that humanitarians are looking for is this kind of new humanitarian regime of notification rather than permission. So Mm. That means that we would move to, rather than asking for permission every time we want to send a truck into the country or we want to open a border, that the assumption is that the parties are already committed to maximum humanitarian access and that they have given a blanket approval and that the UN or other humanitarian agencies that are trying to move assistance in, that they would no longer seek permission every time they try to move, that they just notify the parties, both parties, so that there's kind of full transparency, but that we are not being held up, you know, to the whims of individual leaders or the day-to-day machinations that might be driving the political process, that we essentially create an immunity for, for humanitarian aid, that it goes through unencumbered, and that the humanitarian agencies simply notify. That's, I think, the thing that everyone is aiming for right now. The parties have given their consent to that, but as we know, they've given their consent in the past and had it not implemented. So the idea is to see this move from the commitment phase to really the action phase and for that to be sustained over a period of time. Well, Cameron, thank you as always. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to Global Dispatches. The show is produced by me, Mark Leon Goldberg. It is edited and mixed by Levi Sharp. If you are listening on Apple Podcasts, make sure to follow the show and enable automatic downloads to get new episodes as soon as they're released. On Spotify, tap the bell icon to get a notification when we publish new episodes. And of course, please visit globaldispatches.org to get on our free mailing list, get in touch with me, and access our full archive. Thank you.